In life, sometimes people want to make boundaries. For example, a person is concerned about the level of kashrut, or kosher dietary law that observed for some people, and therefore they put the boundary by saying a statement. So here we are on Tractat Nedarim, page 18, the middle of the page, the Mishnah said to us, If a person make an oath that I should not eat, he just want to put a boundary, but he repeats it twice, so we have a different formulation of punishment, like a um, need to bring a offering, need to have malkot. So it said here, the second one is not considering as a valid statement. So here, the issue is he goes before the sage, and the sage abrogated the vow. So it still have halot shuad, still have the matter of oath for the second one versus the first. So the Sigma said, Mi mai, how do Rabba know that? So again, he goes by the idea that he is, have the effect of annulment for the first, but not the second. So the Shach, if they go in and you read in the Yoredeah, Reish Lamed Chet, 238, Seif Kavav, 26, he asks a question, what about a woman that make a vow that she will not eat bread, for example, for 30 days? Now the question is, if she go before the sage, in, she repeat it twice. So she goes before the sage, and he abrogated that, so that the pray would call mikan lemafreya, which means it's affected the first one, but the second one it's still in effect. Versus if she go before the husband, the husband can annul it, but it's called mikanu lehaba, which means from now and onwards, which means that it's total annulment. Lish nachrina, another option. The idea of obligation of Malkot or offering for the second one, he doesn't have, but the matter of ODF. If you ask the wise um, for the first ODF, so he obligated for the second one. So the Khatam Sofer asks a question. When you have this matter of Isu, Lochal al Isu, that uh, meaning the matter of prohibition not take uh, uh, effect when it's a uh, matter of vow or oath. So if he does twice, so he said that the, it's understandable that the first one it's already out, but the second one is not abrogated. If someone make a, a commitment of nezirut, so he count the first one, they fresh and he gave an offering of purified Nazir. And he goes before the sage and he said that I want to terminate the, the, the commitments. So by having the first Nazirut, that already take away the second one. So here it, it's the, uh, basically the, the, the opposite um, it's contradicted what we said. So the, the Gemara rejected said, You know what's the story? If he accept upon himself a Nezirut, two times, um, two terms of Nezirut simultaneously. So he, he, the Ritva explained, if you have a matter of En Halal if a person commit himself not to eat bread and he said it twice, so basically, uh, the idea of receiving a malkot according to advice for Shavuot Shav, for making an, an oath in vanity. Even he have a terhacham, but other disputed with advice and said, why you punish for Shavuot Shav? So since you, uh, you have these two terms, and it cannot be observed a, um, in, 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 and in that subsequent way, when he accepts the two terms simultaneously, that the second term, it's um, a follow immediately, um, and the, uh, the close is first, which immediately took effect bec uh, because you have the sequential period of time. But if he taken oath and he prohibited himself um, for something that is already prohibited by oath, so the same period of time, so the second one is, doesn't have any effect. Now on page 18 of the Mishnah, so the Mishnah said, "Stam darim lehachamir uperusham leakel." You have a vow, but you have an unspecified vow. You express a vow, but you didn't say. So they have to have two different uh, um, way. So, in general, we go stringent, but if 
you have this type of expression followed and you say that you don't mean to prohibit it, then you can go lenient. So here we'll give an example. Keitzad. Amar arei alai kibsar maliach. If he said, this item is prohibited to me like a salted meat. So that salted meat is what the Torah said in Vayikra and Leviticus 2, that every korban, every offering need to be salted. So, uh, like the, the wine that was for the libation of idols. So, so, so in, in general, um, we have to know what's the purpose, because in, in general, they use a lot of time those by idol worshippers. So they said, if he did it for something for the sake of heaven, Shamaim. So therefore, uh, if he did it for the offering that dedicate to God or, or offering that uh, or wine libation to God, so then this is effective nether. Why? Because he ever had passed do. Versus the second option, the imbishal of that kocham nedar, if he did it for the libation of idol worshipping. So therefore, mutar, um, why? Because this is called pasa bedavara su, because he put an attachment for tikrovet avoda zara, and the Torah said uh, clearly in the Deuteronomy 13, velo itbak bedcha meuma minacherem, which means something that is for the idol worshipping, is prohibited by the Torah, so it's already prohibited by the Torah. If you make something like that, it doesn't have any attachment because it's already prohibited. If you say this item is hereby forbidden to me, like item that dedicate to Beit Hamikdash, so the question is what exactly was his intention? If it's considering something that dedicate to heaven, which is some type of form of consecration, because this is had pasabed abaranadu, so it's prohibited. Asu bim kecherem shel koanim, but if it's like a dedication to koanim. So one pledges his answer to a gift to, to Kohanim. So mutar. So it's permitted. It's, um, uh, they said the imstam, if he said only that it's like a cherem, but he didn't specify to which one, asut is forbidden. Why? Because you go stringent. Uh, so the Rosh asked a question, why you don't have Chalot Neder? And the Rosh explained, so after the Kohen received it, it's already the same as Chulin, something that's not consecrated. So he so have a test with Avara Mutar. Area, like a master, if he said that this is like a uh, forbidden to me, like a tide, in Kemasar, be Manadar, if, in, uh, this is the Torah, um, have a mitzvah in Leviticus 27, to take one from every tenth of animal um, that person have or flock and give it to animal tide. You bring all those calf, all these sheep to the um, um, uh, 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 place, and he said he, he put a, a red sign every tent, and he said this is a, um, a tithe. That's the Mishnah instructed Pchor at page 58. So this uh, carry a kedushat korban and sanctification of offering, and their blood sprinkled on the corner of the altar. So this, yeah, the question is, if you ever had pasabed davar anadu. So as Pasab and Avarana do, they have the attachment to something that is take a vow. So the, if it's Masar Bema, it's good. But if it's uh, the first tithe, Masar Rishon, so it's allowed to those Zarim. Um, and uh, because this is at best, but Avara Muta. So he said, again, so what we said, Im ki Masar Bema Nadar Asu, v'im it peace, shall go and Muta, v'im Stam Asu. But if it's uh, just something that he doesn't specify, that's prohibited. Why? Because you go stringent and you said that he make a pasa with something that is animal tied. Hare like it ruma, if you make this as, as something that you buy to me, like a truma, in kitumat alish kanadar, if you take that it's a collection that they uh, have for the Beit Amigdash, the temple treasury cha- chamber, asu is prohibited because this is at pasab the barnadu. Vim shall go mutar, but if it's for the granary that given to the Kohanim, so it's allowed. Why? Because it's considered it's something that uh, needs pass with Avara Asu. Vim Stam, if it's not specified with Truma, Asu de Rab Meir. Rabbi Yudah, Omer Rabbi Yudah, said some Truma, regular, unspecified Truma, Bi Yudah, so Rabbi Yudah, if it's Judah, is forbidden, but if it's Galate, it's, um, it's allowed. Why? Because the reality is that Shen Shekalim, like Green Truma Talishkal, people who live in Galate are not familiar 
with dedication of this temple treasury. And therefore, because the distance from Yerushalayim, so it did not get used, so they call it just general uh, Tuma. Um, uh, uh, so they call it Tumat Lishka, not general Tuma. So therefore, if uh, someone in Galilite make this type of Tuma without specification, so you have to assume that it's for the granary, because this is not something to do. So it says, Tam Ramim, if you have general unspecified dedication, Biudam Mutarim Bagalasurim, again, if it's Judea, it's permitted. If it's Galilite, they are forbidden. Because people in Galilite did not, are not familiar with some they dedicate to the Kohanim. So when they say dedication, they are referring to dedication to Shamayim, to heaven. So therefore, um, um, for them, um, it's prohibited. So the Gemara asks a question, Vehatnan. We learned in the Mishnah, in Tractate Taharot, chapter 4, Mishnah uh, number 12. Safek nezirut lehakel, which is, if we are not sure if the, there is a commitment of nezirite, so we go lenient. So, the Torah said that the person needs to say clearly that I commit myself, isho isha ki aflil no nerne, a person ki he is commit himself clearly, but if it's uncertain, so we basically go lenient. So how you explain it with the Mishnah, that usually uh, the, they say that the intermediate nether is treated stringency, and here you see in the Mishnah Tarok that is lenient. So the big question, it's a discussion, you see it in Chazon Echezkel and others, um, can we differentiate between the intent and the reality, which means if that stipulation fulfills. So the Gemara said, Amara Bizera, lo kashya. It's not a contradiction. You know why? Hara Biliezer Rabbanan. The Mishnah about Nazir is follow Rabbi Eliezer, and the other one, follow Rabbanan, the sages. So here, <coughs> the Tanya. Hamagdish chayato u behemto, hegdish et akoi. Here you have a situation that someone who consecrated his entire livestock, his all animals he consecrated. The problem is one of his animal is kind of mixture. Koi, it's something that it's not clear if it's a beast, if it's, you know those, uh, you see it in Africa, wild animals, you're not sure how you call them and the combination of more than, than one species. So, some said, the Rema said, you know, that it's a buffalo. But not everyone agrees. But anyway, it's a combination of Chaya and Behemah, and two. Rabbi Lezer said, excuse me, the Koi, the mixture, it's not consecrated because it's not part of the deal. Man de Amar, according to the sages that said, Mamono me'ayel lisfeika meaning when you take your money and you enter the domain of uncertainty, which is in your mind is that this money will be consecrated or prohibited, even it's not clear in the language of your expression of vow. So therefore, you hold also subject that is own person to a prohibition when it's a case of doubt. And therefore, we go in a general make of this type of vow, stringent. Uman de Amar, and according to Rabbi Yezer that said, Mamono lo me'ayles feika, that he said that the money, it's not subject to, uh, to, um, um, to a, 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 a doubt, because usually a people, when it's come to money, they have to be very clear. If it's not clear and it's doubt, so, gufei namei kol sheken de lo me'ay lesfeika. So how much so when it's come to the the um, the gufei uh, namei, which is the the um, if you talk about undomesticated animal and domesticated animal, and you go only by the something that is definitely undomesticated animal. And definitely, undomesticated <coughs> animal. 
So certainly will not subjugate to a prohibition in a case that it's a doubt. So if it's a doubt, it's not clear. So even you have stam nedarim, general nedarim, so you go lenient, and that's the spirit of the Mishnah. So let's wrap up our understanding to make sure that we all clearly understand what it's all about. We learn the Mishnah that stam nedarim, if you have a general matter of vow, so it's a fake, if it's a doubt, so you go stringent. The Gemara asks a question, if you have a stam nazir with a general statement of uncertain nazir, you go by safek, if it's a uncertain, you go lenient. The question is, is that considering also a form of neder or not? And if yes, why you go lenient? So Rav Zerah said, Rav Zerah hold, the Mishnah go by the Rabbana, by the sages. And when it's come to the nazirut, you go lenient because you, you follow Abeliezer. And then we ask a question about koi, about you have an animal that is a mixture, if domesticated, non-domesticated is not clear, like uh, Rema tells us, like buffalo and this type of animal. So if it's not a matter of uh, consecrated, it's not hagdish, so you do not have a hagdish mamon or goof. So uh, when it's come to n nazir, someone who commit himself to nazir, right? So you have the safek nazirut leakel, you go by the, the uncertain what if he's in a Z or not, you go lenient. Or you go by the other way away around, which is the Rabban of the sages that said he since combine all of his animals, all of his animals including Koi, the one who is not clear, and therefore it's Kolel, it's all follow the Hegdesh Mamon, so therefore you go and you Machmir, you are stringent in both of them. Now it's important to note that that in Stam Nedarim, in general term of Nedarim, you go stringent, and that's what we mentioned earlier, the, uh, the uh, famous Shach, you see it in Shulchan Oruch 208, that unspecified vow are treated stringently, but their specification may, may treat it leniently or stringently. So if one vows, for example, the produce will be, to, uh, will be to him like the wine used for libation or like salted meat. His statement can be understood either by associating the hem of a vow, an item that forbidden by means of vow, which is libation, a wine of the altar and salted meat of an offering, or an association the item of a vow with an item that is forbidden by the Torah, which is libation wine and salted meat of idol worship, if he specified that he meant an offering the vow takes effect and the produce is forbidden. If he says he meant idol worship, the vow does not take effect. In this case, even if he is in a ignoramus, he does not need it to make a request to Allah authority for the, the solution heter, of the vow. If the vow went unspecified, so the Rambam said in the Chotnerim chapter two that the produce is forbidden. Rabbi, we have a question. It's uh, kind of a unique situation, but we have a uh, religious school where the principal of the religious school is sec is secular and uh, had a program where they uh, she collected quote unquote tzedakah charity from the from the children and then they were going to determine where the uh, funds were going to be sent. Now the uh, administrator of the Tzedakah Fund is, 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 is from and um, was not consulted with regard to the organizations that they wanted to send it to. And one of the organizations, there's certainly a, there's a significant question whether it's truly Tzedakah or not. They provide social services to non-Jews in uh, developing countries. In fact, the one country they don't operate in is, a, is in Israel. It just happens to have been founded by a couple of Jews, but there's no rabbinic endorsement of that of that charity at all. Not even reform. <laughs> there is, in one hand, it's a good question, in one hand there is a point that it's called Mefarnesim Aniyei Akum Im Aniyei Israel which means even in those days there are those who are idol worshippers but there is a concept of Darkei Shalom that you develop a peace by supporting people in need regardless to their faith group. Right. So there are two components in this question. Question number one 
if the one who in charge for the tzedakah distribute the money, if he's taking precedent by distribute the money? The answer is, it is not prohibited to send them the money because it's not terrorist organization. It is an organization of people that the founder or some of the founders do not support Jewish causes. Now, so the first component is, as far as the violation, it is not a violation of Torah law to send the money. On the right. other hand, on the other hand, the one who in charge of tzedakah fund can say, I'm not comfortable sending this money. Here is the money back, and that's it. Um, you do whatever you want, but told my fund, I'm not sending them the money. But to change the direction of that money, it's not so simple for one reason. When those parents and children contributed, it was with the mindset, we always said that the kavana, the mindset is crucial. Their mindset was that the principle determine what's needed. Many times we get here even for non-Jews a contribution and said the rabbi will determine to whom it's a need. So as far as they contributed, in one hand they didn't specify, it, but they basically said that they go by the principal's decision. Now you can argue that the principal decision was wrong, so therefore what do you do? The, the principal already specified it's for this. So in short, there is one of the two. Either you mail the, the, the money and um, you're not in violation, but you tell the principal that that's one time thing, or the one who in charge for the charity write a letter to those parents or whoever is in charge and said, look, um, it's not in my spirit of belief and it's not in the spirit of the charity fund that I'm involved with and therefore I'm leaving it for your decision. Either you want your money back, I'll be more than happy to send you or change the location. The problem with this in general, since it's a school quote-unquote money, it can be um, a accumulation of small money from different people that you do not know who gives what. It can be this one gave a quarter and this one gave ten dollars, etc. and this one. So the more I think, the more I come to conclusion that the principal need to be called and understand that it's one time thing. You're mailing that to that organization and from now on it has to be located and approved by the people of Tzedakah Fund. Thank you, Rabbi. Shuloim, Malachai, Shuloim, Malachai.